start? Because otherwise we miss the lunch break. Uh, okay, so welcome back again. So we just scheduled a little session on um, light audio processing, uh, light electronics, as we normally say, because it's, we do nothing else than what we've done so far with, with post production. But light electronics are a little bit different because, first of all, you don't have time, it's all light. You cannot have huge buffer sizes. You have to take care with your algorithms. You cannot have algorithms with a huge FFT because this just takes too much time to fill up the buffer. And um, very quickly, you'll see that um, the concepts are somehow different. Because when I work in a studio, I co can go back and forth. I can fix the little details. I can do whatever I want to. Life just goes on. So there is no back. Um, if something goes wrong, it happens. Better forget at the time when it's wrong <laughs> that it happened. Um, <laughs> but the nice thing is, um, Spot originally, for example, comes from this directions of uh, from this direction of life coding, uh, not life coding. Sorry, of of, of life processing. Mm -hmm. Since Ericum is very mixed music, so um, you may know or not that Maxim SP was created at Ericum. <coughs> um, so the original project was uh, FTS, and then it became Max MSP. So MSP. Some people say it stands for Miller S Pocket. Um, who was working with David Sicarelli and both left then, and the one was doing his company and the other one was uh, doing his wonderful project, uh, Pure Data. But the aim of Maximus B is still the same. It's a graphical programming languages, a language which allows you to do beautiful things in real time. And so when you work with mixed music, which is the other term, so you record live on stage, you transform the material, you put it back. Um, both languages like Maximus B and uh, Pure Data are quite a nice choice. If you want to go into algorithmic composition and you want to do a lot of list processing and whatever, it might not be the first choice to do this in Maximus B. Um, with ODOT maybe. Yeah. Um, however, so the, what we wanted you to, to see a little bit, so you, you've been at the concert maybe in, on Tuesday, and so Rama was presenting his piece, Flores, uh, which he created in 2011, 12, when he was in residency, and I think it's quite nice to see how he's using um, Ableton Live as a kind for mixed media playback and to get cues which are triggered with a foot paddle on stage, because also interaction, it's a huge question when you work with, uh, with life. So you want to have musicians to interact with the music, so you could have sensors, you all know this stuff. So, <coughs> And so, yeah, we plan a very short se session just that Brahma can show you the setup he was using, and then maybe I show you some other uh, little helpers or how you can organize in a, an easier way to get up from traditional Maximus B patching. So in traditional Maximus B patching, you had your DSP running, and then you had message boxes somewhere, and the queue was coming in, whatever the queue is, and then you had these huge message boxes which were sent over the patch, and then you've been sitting in a rehearsal, and then the conductor was saying he wants to, I don't know, the sound move faster, or the composer, and then you had to go to the sub patch of a sub patch of a sub patch to find the message box to fix it, and then to click on it, and it did the wrong, and it's a mess. Yeah. So it's way better to have this in a text file um, or in a somehow ad more advanced language. And so the one uh, Rama is using is uh, ODOT, and the one uh, we are mainly using is Antis Kofo. Um, and we just wanted to give you a very brief overview on what's happening. Yeah. OK. Um, so <clears throat> so the, the piece you heard um, the other night, Flores, so this this was a piece that Marcus had a, a funny comment the other day that he thought the, the big problem with the piece is that I had too long to work on it, which is, <laughs> which is kind of true because, I mean, it, was, it came out of a residency that was a, a year long at Aircam. And, um, and, you know, a big part of that was um, the project was really needed that time. It was, it was how do we use these speaker systems as instruments? You know, we have this wave field array, and, and so I, I, my proposal was, you know, 
hey, we have these speaker systems, but how, I mean, how can we actually use them for aesthetic purposes if they only exist in a few places? We need more people to go in there with um, strange ideas and try some, as some um, non-idiomatic ways of using the systems to try to figure out what are the, what are the thresholds of the instrument and, and how can it be an, how can it be an instrument, you know, instrument, instrument, instrument. And um, in terms of real time, um, of course, you know, most instruments are real time instruments. Um, there are some major benefits to working in non real time. Um, you can get, uh, you can do renderings of very high orders in, in layers. You know, you can compose um, layers, get very high, very clean recordings and put them all together and have a very pristine um, rendering. You can do that in real time if you have the CPU power. But that's really the, the wall that, that I run up against a lot is that I make these processes. So for instance, at, uh, during this residency, I would spend, you know, I was very lucky. I mean, wow, I, I wish I could do this again. Uh, but you know, um, so kind of like next week, people who are um, doing the, the residency will have somewhat like what I had, like a week in a studio with a wave field array. So you have um, a lot of the time is spent um, preparing things to test. It's a bit like a laboratory. You prepare patches, you get ideas, okay, I want to try this approach. You make the approach, you try it out. Um, and so when you're bringing these experiments into a real-time situation, um, you end up making kind of modules that perform the different kinds of approaches that you've developed through, through your sort of instrument, your instrumental practice. Um, and so what I ended up doing uh, for the patch, actually, let me, I have a wiring diagram. Ah. And this is a problem with long. So maybe while you search, I Sorry. can explain a little bit. So Rama was working in our concert hall, um, which uh, in 2011 uh, was built with 350 loudspeakers, to a, a four WFS arrays around the audience with 260 whatever speakers, and a dome uh, with additional 75 speakers, four, um, so on top of the wavefeed synthesis array for doing ambisonics up to order nine, because we share some speakers with the wavefeed. So it's a quite beautiful room where you can change the acoustics. You have turning panels, um, so you can bring the acoustics down to 0 0.4 seconds reverberation time, and the highest is about four seconds of reverberation time. So it was running on, on so the, the entire array is driven on, on five Mac Pros, um, so one for each wave synthesis array and one for the ambisonic stone. And so the idea was when we've been uh, creating the system that we need composers to work with. And so we invited two composers uh, which have been in residency, so it was Natasha Barrett and, and, and Rama. And um, so he was working on the system and um, as you've heard in the piece, the sound grains, uh, the Boyd's, which come from the Boyd's... Um, Flocking algorithm? Yeah, for, uh, algorithm. Around, and you, you, you see here, They've been distributed to ambisonics, so this was an ambisonics only version, but also the wave feed synthesis. And so some of these little grains were close to the audience because they've been projected into the space um, by using focused sound sources. And now you found your thing. Sorry, shallow. that took so long. Uh, so this is the wiring diagram. All the, the squares here are computers. Um, so the cello comes into the main client computer, which is the big one there. Um, and that cello signal goes into Ableton, where I'm running, um, I'm using that to uh, control all the automation. Um, and also there's some um, synthesis stuff going on in there, some um, uh, envelope followers that trigger different things. Um, and so that, from Ableton, there's a, a local UDP send to an instance of Max running in parallel. Um, and that's kind of the uh, synchronization module uh, that is 
funneling all of the OSC stream from Ableton and coordinating certain things. And uh, then there are three st uh, standalone applications that are running um, Boyd's flocking algorithms. I'll, I'll open these patches up in a second and show you. Uh, so there's three flocks of points that are active. And I had to split them into standalone uh, applications just because it was too much processing to run on in one, to do everything in one instance of max. So that's a trick you can use for real time. When you run out of CPU power, you can start to parallelize your processes and build standalone applications that will run on separate cores on the computer. Um, and so I'm taking advantage of that here to a large extent. Yeah, so the blue lines here are the OSC messages. There's also a MIDI pedal from the cello that goes into the client computer that uses the Ableton. Um, it's just MIDI mapped to the next Q button. So when you press the pedal, it goes to the next Q in Ableton. Um, I also have a BCF controller that I'm um, using to uh, balance levels. That's going directly into the OSC control dispatch patch. So all of those things go out to UDP. And they're uh, broadcast to the five um, server computers that are, are running in parallel. So there's a computer here, one for each of the wave field arrays, and then a fifth computer for the ambisonics array. These, this is back in 2012. So these were um, the old silver tower <laughs> Mac Pros. When I came here I was for the concert this week, I thought, ah, oh, we're using the new ones. It's going to be cool. I can do more, but actually I couldn't. So um, we still have a, a CPU issue. Um, when, when you start doing a lot of spatial processes, it gets expensive because you know you think about every channel that you have to operate on. When you have a lot of channels, it's just more operation. Similarly, on each computer, um, I had to make standalone applications for the different spatial processes. For instance, with the wave field arrays, it doesn't make sense. I can't send the encoded wave field array to the computer to send out. I mean, you could. You could, let's say you had a, you know, a 88 channel array. You could send, you could do the wave field on another computer and send it through, and, but it doesn't really make any sense, right? So we're using the server computer to do the encoding into wave field. Um, so I'm sending in a smaller number of channels. It's doing the um, the wave field encoding. I, th I can call that an encoding, right? I don't know. Rendering. Rendering. Uh, and then sending out to the channel. So the server is there to do this spatial rendering. So if you have uh, idiosyncratic um, processing that is also in dealing with the wave field process, it, you also want to put that on your server. That kind of has to be there. I ended up having three standalones on each server also. It's tricky because there's a lot of standalones here. So Thibaut helped me make a, a nice script that I could run from the client computer to start up all the standalones, which was really helpful. And another one to kill them all, which was also helpful. Um, you know, now in 2018, I mean, I guess we still have to do the same thing, just because, I mean, as I'm, I'm seeing, but I think that if I were to do this piece again, I would, I would try to reduce it a little bit more. I feel like maybe if I started from scratch, I think I could get this down to be a little bit more efficient. But, but and what I mean to say by that is that I've learned <coughs> since then that it makes a lot of sense that if you're going to create a real-time performance patch, um, that you know it really is. The, the response of the computer is really important, and it, you can feel it. I mean, when you're performing with this, it's real time. It's, you need it to respond in, in a certain way. Um, I would probably now, because you know, like I was saying, I developed these, these processes um, through a, a sequence of, of tests in the studio that, that were each kind of in their separate kind of research world. Each module was its own period of, of development. Um, but when I'm designing an instrument in Max, what I do now is I, I start with like a you know 32 
vector size as you know as small as I can I can get with them to be reasonable, and it re, you know fast responding, um, and then I build up the system, keeping the performative aspect of the electronics always at the forefront, and so that's a different approach than what I used here, which is that I developed these these processes first, and then brought them into an instrumental situation. I mean, I was of course experimenting with them, each one separately, but it wasn't as a, as a whole. So um, I think if I, if I were to do it now, from that perspective, it would be maybe more efficient. So I, oops, I encourage you all to do it that way. Right, so that's a good question, thank you. So the, the Mahdi coming out of the client computer I'm sending, I think the original was 18 channels from the client computer. Uh, I think now I have it down to 16. Um, and I send the same signals to each server. And then each server processes it differently based on uh, its context. So we were using, because the, the Wavefield array was distributed across four computers, um, they're all handled separately. So there's, each wall is a separate wave field unit. So that means that there's no, there's not one filter set that, it's not a circular array. And so what we're doing is crossfading between the, the, the wave field arrays. From, and that's all controlled via OSC from the client computer. For the processing of the wave field filter, like the WFS object, is there one on each individual computer? There's, Three on each individual computer. Uh, yeah, on each of the wave field computers here, there are, like each Boyd flock is 25 sources. I have the, the directivity turned off for all of them because it's too expensive. You can only render, the CPUs are still not really powerful enough to do a lot of uh, wave field sources with directivity in real time. Um, another reason that, you know, fixed media is, does have some some cool things you can do. Yeah, so let me show you some of the patches. Do you add different amount of delay for every station? Is that the... What do you mean delay for every station? Um, so you do three different WFS processes, right? Yes, in parallel. In parallel. And what, what is the difference? Oh, ah. Uh, well, so the... So this is... Uh, I'm going to show you... Not a wave field version, but let's say here's the ambisonic server that we used that I used um, for the concert this week, and it's very similar to the to what's going on in the wave field. Um, so on each uh, on each computer, there's one standalone. That was cool when I got it to. Yeah, I can't do it again. Anyway, the first square here is a standalone. I don't know if you can read it, but it says source. It says slash source. And so those are the, the uh, direct sources. So I have um, eight point sources that are kind of traditional point sources. Some of them are like stereo pairs. And so for each computer here, there's one standalone that's dealing with those traditional sources. Then there's a uh, process which I developed called um, the wave field focus source delays, which I talked about a little bit last year, which is where I'm manipulating the delay times for the wave field. So what I do is I just multiply the delay times by some crazy number, and then it creates a kind of domino effect. So, so let's say you have a focus source uh, in front of the array. Um, what it's doing is it's actually um, playing the, the it's, it does this time reversal thing that probably Marcus talked about. Um, and so it plays the outer speakers first, and then the, the speakers closest to the, sorry, the speakers, they're all oriented to the source. Uh, what am I trying to say? Do you know what I mean? So the delays are reversed, so they come from the outside in, and then they, they all join at, because they've been perfectly calculated, they all go and then they cross and you get the focus source in the, in the middle of the space. 
So if you, if you multiply those delays, you end up getting, it's, I mean, it totally ruins the focus source effect, but it gives you something different, which is that it, it steps through the speakers on the array one by one, increasing in speed because it creates this lobe. So it goes and then at the last second in, in uh, aligned with the last delay, I then play a non-scaled version of the focus source, so then you get you do get the focus source at the last aligned with the last delay. I have a quick question mm -hmm. about and is that was that a different object you were using? Was that a WFS without a tilde? Without a tilde, yeah. And is that powered in SPAT5? It is, I think. Okay. Yeah. So there's there's a SPAT5 dot WFS tilde and SPAT5 WFS non tilde. Um, and that gives you the delays and gains. And actually, I think Thibaut even put in a scaling um, dial for doing, like, <laughs> which is kind of fun. But I, I, I would probably not, I think it's, a, I don't know what his scaling measure is. So I would probably still just multiply it because I probably want a higher number than whatever he put in there. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's what's going on, the wave field delays. And I can, I can show the patch. Okay, I'm going to describe the voids, but I'm also going to start up the patch. So I'm going to now shift to talking about how the patch is set up, and okay. then I'll show you the voids as well. So we're going to take a step back here. Really, we have the delays? Yeah. And we have the delays. Wow. Okay. Okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to keep patching. So Marcus, I think, um. is going to play the focus source delays, but while he's figuring out how the patch works, I'm going to... So this is my setup from this week. So here there are the standalones I was talking about oh, of, yes. the, of the voids that are running on the mm -hmm. client computer. So in this, this is the HOA only version. Yeah. Sorry, um, and I can show you really quick. Good. Right. Sorry. Let me open up everything and that, that will be easier to make sense of it. Is there an output level? So what's important with this setup is because everything is coming from everything is coming from the client computer, the order of, of opening things is important. So you have to first open all of the standalones, all of the sort of performance boxes, and then you have to make sure that the OSC dispatch, that, that sort of funneling um, max patch where it's taking all the OSC messages from Ableton and sending them to the servers, that also has to be on first. And then you can open up Ableton, which has all of the automation data in it, so that when it sends out its initialization messages, it's caught, it's routed to all the right places. Mm -hmm. So are you using a max for live patch instead of like Tosca? For yeah, I mean, Tosca, I might flatter myself in saying that Tosca is a version of my patch that I made at your camp. <laughs> I mean, Tosca is great because it works in every DAW. Yeah. I mean, you can do the same thing in Max for Live. And actually, to answer your question about limitations of channel counts, if you make your own in Max for Live, there's no limitation to how yeah. many channels you have. Have you published that patch online? Is that available? Or? No, but it's so easy. It's, all it is is a, I mean, I can show you right here. This is, this is the original one from 2012. It's, all it is is um, some dials that go out to with our, that are labeled with um, yes. OSC messages, yes. yeah. Using yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm not proud of this patch. This is very old. It's six boxes. I, and actually, I think some of the, uh, okay. this, yeah, I would do it differently now. I, at the time, it seemed like using an observer was better than using the output directly from the GUI. So the graphic stuff is all in here. It's a six boxes. So here's the interface. Um, so it has azimuth elevation distance, yaw aperture, and um, the axis and omni filters, which you might recognize from SPAT Opper. So basically, I made a kind of reduced version of SPAT Opera just for the stuff that I needed for the piece. And then this patch just basically routes all of that off and sends it to over UDP. 
And I, this patch is, is outdated. I wouldn't do it this way anymore. Using the observers, I don't think that's actually more efficient anymore. I think that just going directly out of the live GUI objects is more efficient than using the observers. But just so you can see how it works, it's quite, it's not, it looks more complicated than it is. The complicated, actually the most complicated part is that it's, it links to the cello, it, sorry, it links to another channel. I made them all MIDI devices uh, because I wanted to be able to copy the automation data from one place to another. And I can make, you can make um, blank MIDI clips in Ableton. Mm -hmm. So you, you create a region um, and you can create a MIDI clip and then all the automation that is within that MIDI clip can be copied and pasted separate from the actual audio. So then you could have, you could manipulate the spatial parameters separate from the, the audio, which is on a separate track. And I, I, the way I do this is I link, I use the um, max for live API to uh, query the existing channels and, and, and attach to the one that has the same name as the spat channel. So here it says, you can see it's, oh, there's all these um, spat slash something. Yeah. And what that means is it's, th it, the object takes off the spat slash and then attaches to the channel that has the name of the, what comes after the slash. That's how that works. I also made a version of this for the envelop um, project in San Francisco. Um, the current version now is using uh, the Max uh, Live 10 system for sending multi-channel audio between devices. But if you go back and look at the original version, it's, it's basically the same as this. So that's maybe a more recent. Um, if you wanted to grab some code from there, it's all open source. And on, on, the, on the envelop for live um, GitHub page. OK, so back to the Boyds. So now I've set up the, um, so I've opened the live session. I have my message server open. And in here, there's a main patch. This is like quick and dirty stuff here. So apologies for having it not be perfectly clean. But um, everything comes in through this UDP receive 555. Notice that it says SYNMAT at the end here. There's a special mode for UDP receive that's SYNMAT mode, and that means that it sends a full packet. It supports the full packet message. So when you send a OS, an ODOT bundle, or an OSC bundle um, through via UDP, if you want to receive it as an OSC bundle, not as a sequence of individual messages, but time synchronized, you need to put it in SYNMAT mode, um, and then it will come out as a full packet. I think you can also, I think you can also set it to full packet mode, which is the same thing. And are you, how are you, do you have to put that send mat on the send as well? Like no, the no, the send is automatic. Oh, is it packet? Well, the UDP send just sends a byte stream of whatever you send in. Okay, so here, so basically you can see that everything is coming in from the UDP receive, and then I have a few, I have a few different processes that, that process the OSC message in different ways. The original version, is here. I don't know if you can how well you can read that, but um, what's happening here is that it's it's uh, panning between the wave field arrays. So here's the S Pro. Ah, we have fo we have delays. Cool. Um, so as I move this this source around, you can see that it's crossfading between wave field arrays. That's this in the multi slider here. And basically, it's using spat pan non tilde to give me the gains for the, for the different, um, different arrays. And it sends out a list of, actually, what does it send out? I forget what it sends out, but somehow we're, <laughs> why are we summing the pairs there? This is a very old, this is six years old, so I, <clears throat> I haven't looked at it since then. Oh, I guess it's, Sending out individual. Uh, 
Anyway, it's sending out a list of gains for all the different um, arrays. And then I use that to uh, basically crossfade between the different arrays. So if you imagine a list, it's basically right coming out right here. So here, uh, WFS 1 and 4 are, are playing, which I guess is, are these two here. I think it was for Flores where we made also a function where you come from Ambisonics and you pan down, mm -hmm. and then it's handed over to the WFS, yeah, and then right you here. get into the volume. It's only the WFS because that's, we cannot yeah. handle it. Oh, yeah, right. that's here. That's right here. We cannot handle it. With. So, right, because the WFS is a two-dimensional plane, although, as Bobby showed, it's actually, there is a, a width to it, which is pretty cool. Um, and actually, what I did here is, is kind of related to that width thing. Um, there's this thing called Z-clip. And the Z-clip here is basically saying, at what point does the wave field enter in the Z-axis? So it's actually a slice. So it's, it's slicing the space and creating this, this volume that when the sources come into this region, then it can go into the wave field array. And that's important to, um, to maintain the, the elevation information, because if you were to put, always put everything in the wave field array, it's going to then, even if the sound is supposed to be way up there, it's going to be coming out of the wave field and it's going to blur everything. So this is a very pretty simple patch, actually. It just says, um, is the so the third, uh, I, the third element of the XYZ list, the Z coordinate, is that less than or equal to the Z clip? If so, play it in the WFS. If not, then don't. So there are two options when you have a huge speaker array. You define it as one big speaker array, and you have to program the different algorithms that they see it as one speaker array, and the algorithm is taking care about all this panning. Um, so we've been thinking of this approach for our concert hall, but since we mainly work with computer musicians who want to use arrays in their own way, we see them as individual arrays, and it's up to you to define how the sources are defined on the different arrays. So for Rama, it was better to say, when we pan it down, then the wave field takes over, and as soon as you get into the volume, it's only wave field, but there was a kind of panning function between ambisonics and wave field. So the closer you came to the wave field, the more the wave field took over. But you kept until the point where you've been in horizontal plane more or less the coloration of ambisonics. Right. Um, because we didn't want to have, just think about white noise or pink noise, and you pan it, and it's shh, and then you come to the wave field, which in our case is way much more band limited than here, then it's shh, 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 then you get your phasing in the wave field. So we didn't want to have this. So as long as you've right. been far away, it was a mix, even in horizontal plane, between ambisonics and wave feed. And then when he, when he came into the volume with his focus sound source, we said, OK, that's only possible with wave feeds. The right. so wave so feed's taking over. And that's, that's this part right here. So you can see, if the distance is less than seven meters, then basically don't play it in the, in the ambisonics array. Otherwise, do a kind of um, equal power uh, panning between the, the two system. So maybe I'll just talk a little bit more about this, and then we'll do the Yeah, we thing. have 10 minutes left. Well, I wanted to show you the voids. OK, so, so in here, this isn't hooked up to the audio, so it's, it's going to be, we'll, we'll, we'll listen to the wave field delays in a second. But just to show you this, I'm going to go through and make these all visible and play a little bit so that the, come on. Oh, right. Blah, 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 okay. And now, if I go to the voids. So as you can see here, while he's patching and talking, um, I take over. Uh -huh. um, what we very often do, you create standalones to have different processes running as a standalone or on different Max MSPs. Um, on the one hand, it's important that if you run out of processing power, you can distribute it over different machines. 
And on the other hand, um, sometimes when you do very complex algorithms and during a live concert, one of the algorithm fails and max number four crashes, you just restart max number four, but the rest of the show is going on. Um, so it's for two reasons. So on the one hand, distributed over different computers when you run out of processing power. And on the other hand, when something crashes, it only crashes normally one of the max. So I'm, we are very often limited. So what I normally do is a limited one processor, one CPU is taking over one max MSP. Yes. It's, no, it's the same. It's the same in, in terms of CPU power you need. If you do not have any special needs for getting something else done than simple mixing, you could use the standalone. But for example, like in my case that I then very often end up, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a little convolution reverb somewhere, which is not yet built into a uh, panoramic, so I could define input channel whatever I just get rid of the input channel. I put in my little uh, ambisonics encoded convolution reverb, feed it in as a bus into panoramics, and then I can use it in the mix. So it really depends. It's, it can be a nice tool, just you know, getting that you don't have to patch with all the encoding, decoding, and whatever. And before you put just your processing, live processing. Our computer musicians at Aircam start to use it that way, as an object in Max MSP which is, makes it very simple that when you come to a concert hall and you've been working in ambisonics, but the speaker array doesn't allow to have proper ambisonics to swap over to VBAP or whatever, without patching. And all the processing is before in the max patch. OK, so I'm going to try to go quickly because we don't have that much time. So basically, there's three flocks of, of uh, voids going on here. There's um, a max for live device here that I use to control the flocks. So there's a bunch of. Um, uh, factors regarded to the behavior of the flocks. I'm using the jit.3d.boids, or no, jit.boids3d object. Um, and then these are some parameters for that object. Um, there's also some reverb for those points and some manipulation of the flock, um, like uh, translating them all, um, scaling them all, and then and then I'll show you how that works in a second. So those come in here. There's mapping here so that uh, comes in. And there's uh, originally, I was controlling this with a BCF controller. Um, and then the BCF mapping is here. So the sliders have some scaling. And then that all goes out over UDP to a local standalone. OK. Let's look at Boyd's 1. Boyd's 1. There you are. OK. So in here, this is the local uh, standalone. So it has a UDP port. Um, it comes into the Boyd's engine, the Boyd's wrapper, uh, which is a basically just a big ODOT root that converts from uh, OSC to the parameters that the Boyd's 3D object needs. There's some jitter stuff to display it. And then the, the real magic part here is the, is the mapping. Um, and I hope to start talking about this today in the patching session, um, is ways of dealing with um, groups of points and how, like thinking about how do you, how do you deal with um, a set of points rather than just one and, and try to create a kind of uh, a way that where, where you take advantage of the fact that you have a volume of, of points and how do you try to um, get the most out of that as you can. One great way is to decorrelate them. So the more they are separated, the more you hear them as separate things. Um, and so for that, each, each point has a different delay and filter. And there's some mapping that describes that. Um, and then that goes out here, and I guess I thought that was going directly out, but I guess it's not. Um, that comes, anyway, somewhere, <laughs> I forget where. That goes out to the servers and controls the Boyd's algorithm there. And if you would be interested to see that very quickly before we do the wave field delays, um, here is the 
void server that I was using on Tuesday. I don't know if you can hear my computer, but I'm, you know, I'm just sending, there's a lot of OSC going out, and, and uh, that, that as, you know, it's not audio processing, but it's still processing, and there's a lot of it, so that's a real concern. Um, so here's a Boyd's patch. Um, it has one audio input, so I'm sending in these kind of granulated sounds that are coming from the cello, and also from some uh, algorithmic engines that are generating grains of um, little percussive sounds that are related, that are, yeah, combined with the, the live cello. And those grains come in here through the, uh, the single channel. It goes through a filter bank, which splits them out into 25 separate channels, each with a separate filter. And then I use spat delay to delay them all differently, um, or you know, delay them in terms of the mapping. And what I'm using for the mapping is I'm using the distribution of the points as a input source to control the, both the spatial location and the parameters for the uh, processing. So it's just filter and delay in this, in this one. I have a new device based on this that's um, it's going to be in the new Envelope uh, release coming up soon that also has um, uh, feedback in, inside the delays. So you can do some interesting kind of um, carpal strong sort of things with flocks of points. Uh, that all goes through the spat send, which goes into a poly here. And the poly is a, basically a patched version of um, spat using a image source model. I don't think it's in the current SPAT 5 tutorials, but if you look in the SPAT 4 tutorials, there's a um, image source model, shoebox model a tutorial that, that is basically this patch describes how to, how to do that, that Marcus and I worked on um, in 2012. That's, that's basically it for that one. But you can see, you know, it's a lot of stuff. It's only 22 minutes. That's not enough time. We're going to go over time. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Should we let's hear the let's hear the focus source delays. Here's an ADC. So um, you know, in in a real time performance, this would be a microphone. Uh, could be the mic on the computer, but probably an actual microphone. Um, uh, and that goes into this poly. And inside the the poly patch is here's here's what's happening. This is the wave field delays. So we have. An input, a, a, mess, a message control rate input, and an audio rate input. The uh, control rate input goes into a expert code box, and basically, the main part is that it scales. I don't know if I can highlight this. Uh, this line right here. That line scales the delays from some minimum, scales the delays from, from its original minimum and maximum to zero up to the delay scale, which is determined by the, um, in the Ableton set. So in Ableton, there's a, an envelope follower that triggers um, a capture of the live input and sends a grain to the server uh, alongside an OSC message that describes um, what the treatment should be. So they're both kind of coming in at the same time, and if everything is well synchronized, then this control rate message then sends a trigger to this ASDR object, which, which envelopes the incoming value so there's the, the whole stream. The envelope actually happens here in the, in the, um, in the poly, not in, in, in live. So in live, it's just doing, it's saying, ah, there's an event here, there's an event here. But the, the signal is still just streaming to this poly. It's just not playing anything. So then when the, the message says, OK, there's a grain, we should do the delay, focus delay, then it comes through here and it says, OK, make an envelope. It makes an, a envelope with the incoming signal. And then it goes into the spat tap out with two outputs. So like I was saying, the first output um, 
is a multiplied version of the delay, and so it creates this thing. And then the second one is the, the unscaled version. Uh, and then it gets the delay, the gains from the wave, the correct gains from the wave field. Okay, so enough talking about it. Let's let's hear it. All right, let's do the drum loop. And ready? Here we go. It's pretty quiet. Well, here is the spot meter. The source is rather close, I guess. Where's the source? Fewer. Um, yes. OK. So yeah, so here's the source. So let's say let's move it a bit further out. Um, that's six meters. That's too far? So that's three meters where you're two, <coughs> two, one and a half. So you can get a little bit far. Like that? Yes. No. Yeah. Why don't you do it? Yeah. So now we are three meters away from the right. Yeah, okay. should hit somebody. All right, ready? Look out. Is anybody getting the focus source? It's behind you guys, I guess. Oh, okay. So put it, put it. Run, run the empty closely. Thing. So in the patch, there's actually a um, uh, weighted distribution for where the source is, so they kind of like jump around. But you kind of hear, get the idea. So right now, the delay scale is two seconds. So let's bump that up to 20 seconds. Sorry, I should have clicked that a bunch more times. <laughs> more. All right, well. Uh, but yeah, so you get the idea. So if you, let's say, hmm, um, all right, let me make that, ah, sorry. Let's That's make over. that, it's over? Okay, we're over. We have to set up the next. Oh, we have to set up the next thing, okay. Yes. So it's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> okay, so I guess we have to wrap up. Any last questions before we move on? Tell you can always have ask lunch us later. Now. Yeah. <laughs> okay.